Welcome to, what is this, the fifth lecture now? Fifth seminar, I should say, uh, from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And you're all here familiar with our website. It's CEPR.net. And you can find more information on all of this uh, on our website. And so I won't uh, spend any more time introducing. I want to talk about trade today because obviously it's a huge uh, topic. The, uh, it's in the news quite a bit. You know, it wasn't really uh, until NAFTA, really, trade agreements, and I don't even like to call them trade agreements. I usually call them commercial agreements because the WTO, for example, its most important, economically important elements are not the trade parts of it, the, the uh, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Or the TRIPS agreement is economically uh, more important than the tariff barrier reductions, probably. And... Uh, so they're not really just even trade agreements, and they're certainly not free trade agreements. Uh, and some of my friends from uh, south of the border would argue they're not really even agreements because they feel they're forced down their throats. Uh, so, but nonetheless, uh, we're talking about trade, and we're talking about some of the related topics. And as I, as I was starting to say, the, you know, really wasn't until NAFTA that you had any public awareness. These things used to be just you know, in, buried in the business section. People who were really interested in the subject uh, read about it, maybe. And uh, that was it. And then now, in the last 10 years, they have become issues. So what I want to do here is just clear up some of the issues uh, so that people can have a better understanding of what we're really dealing with in these debates over the WTO, NAFTA, the Andean Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA, uh, whatever we're going to be talking about in the next uh, year or more. And the uh, and I want to start by looking at I want I, I want to help people understand what the editorialists, the newspapers, the Washington Post, when they're talking about the gains from trade, let's start with that and see what are they really talking about according to economists. Um, so there's a standard uh, argument for liberalizing trade, and it goes back to David Ricardo. It goes back before that, but. Uh, he's the one most famously associated with 1817, and it's called the theory of comparative advantage. And basically what he showed was that countries can gain uh, from specialization and trade even when uh, one country is more productive than the other at everything. And it wasn't immediately intuitive, right? If you think if one country is, can produce everything more efficiently than its potential trading partner, uh, then why would it need to trade? And so he showed that, in fact, uh, both countries could gain, even if, uh, if, even if that were true. And that's why it's called comparative advantage, because one country has a comparative advantage, generally, in something. And so here was Ricardo's example from the 19th century. And uh, you have two countries, England and Portugal, and they're producing two goods, wine and cloth. And it's uh, Ricardo had a labor theory of value, and so he was really just looking at the labor requirements here, the classical economist. So uh, didn't really introduce the kind of models that we see today. And so you have basically uh, in this chart, you can see it takes 120 people a year to produce a unit, some unit, a barrel, in Ricardo's text, of wine. He didn't say people, he said men, but that was really 19th century. And, uh, and then it takes uh, them a, a hundred, takes a hundred of them, a hundred people to produce a unit of cloth. And in Portugal, the respective amounts are 80 and 90. So you can see that Portugal is efficient is more efficient in both branches of production. And uh, so the question is, why would both countries gain from trade? So uh, Ricardo said, well, you can see that there's a relative advantage, or what we call comparative advantage, uh, for Portugal in wine. And you can see this by just comparing. It's relatively more efficient. 80 over 120 is less than 90 over 100. So they're relatively, even though they're more efficient in both, they're relatively more efficient in the production of wine. And uh, by the same margin, 
by the same logic, uh, England would have a comparative advantage in producing cloth. And so you can show